Schön. Thank you for, I'm going to reopen the meeting. Um, there was two reasons that we had there. I was in, required a toilet break myself. And uh, in the midst of that, we had received a fully complying partial amendment, which doesn't have any great thing, but is words which clarify things better. Thank you from, I think Councillor Darby came up with that. And so I'm going to move that we propose uh, to the recommendations and it will be seconded by Councillor Fletcher. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, just to bring it to your attention, the, has, something has been clarified there that the words now are either A or B, which it initially meant to be anyhow, um, in the future fund there. You want to go down the page, anything else that's been... Is that the only change? Wake up, you guys. Just a quick point of clarification, Mayor. You may as well have a point. We, we, when we um, adjourned, we were just uh, taking questions on the uh, financial strategy and main budget levers. Have we are. We, have we, are we going to go back to that, are we? We are going to go back to that, man, but, but the, when you get to this bit here, which is about the, the, the um, proposed or possibility of what we do with the port and, and the um, investment fund, We'll come back and so the words have been slightly changed there. But I'm actually talking about the, the financial strategy and budget levers, although the question, last question leapt into another section. So I'm, I have ahead of me talking about the budget le financial strategy and budget lever part of it. So those of you who want to talk about the port and other, just hold your horses. Councillor Ferry, Derby Hills, Watson and Walker... Uh, have questions about, um, just make sure they're within page four, financial strategy and main budget levers. Councillor Ferry, please. Thank you. Uh, pretty sure I'm on the right part of the agenda. There's a lot of moving bits in this. Um, so my question was around um, one of the rules, uh, the new rules, acknowledging these are draft, um, at the moment, we've got some stuff there around cost-benefit analysis, and I'm just really keen that we um, acknowledge that council is not looking for a corporate um, approach to cost-benefit analysis. And um, so when will, where's the opportunity to um, have that conversation as we develop this? I understand that we'll have more conversations about the draft budget rules. Is that the right point? Uh, yes, we'll have more conversations about that. Um, it will pop up in the the financial, the draft financial strategy um, that you'll that will be part of the materials that you'll adopt in February. Um, but there's yes, plenty of time to uh, work through that over the coming months. Um, the, the idea is to set some rules that determine how we make decisions uh, through future annual budgets and uh, other you know, future ad hoc decisions. So it's not something that needs to be resolved today. There'll be plenty of time to talk about how that, that works. I guess the way that we're thinking about it is not just pure financial cost-benefit analysis. It is looking at what are the costs and benefits um, you know, to the community in a, in a broader sense where we can uh, you know, tangibly measure it, so climate impacts, for example. Right, that's, that's reassuring. Thanks, Ross. Um, I would also throw in the climate impacts, which we are identified later on in the proposal as well. Um, so I'm really interested in how we develop that piece of work and just want to signal that's going to be really important to me um, that we get that right. Um, my other question is, um, and this is a bit of a, a tricky one, I don't know if we can answer it today, but I wanted to flag it. Um, we've got in here some stuff around how we deal with the property management, um, the idea that we, you know, if we identify something surplus, we need to turn it over quickly and things like that. I don't necessarily have a problem with that. 
Um, but I am a little bit concerned about how that's going to impact with the fact that we are moving to some things around the 30 year time frames. Um, and so how we might have things that might appear to be surplus in the next 10 years, but actually if we're now shifting to 30 year time frames for some of our thinking around growth, um, how will those two things interact? Um, so in terms of the 30 year thinking, a lot of that is around you know, looking at growth planning, development contributions, policy, etc. What that is is about identifying you know, what we think is required over that time period and making sure we're taking a long term view of planning and, and, um, and funding of that. Um, but I think we'd have to do that on the best information that we have. Um, and we have to make a call around what, uh, you know, for any given asset or, or, or piece, of, piece of land, do we think it's required or not? Um, we have to be careful about just holding on to all pieces of land just in case they might be needed in the yeah. future, because that's not a good use of the council's capital. We'll have to uh, make calls around, you know, what, what does the analysis say? What is needed based off our best, you know, growth and infrastructure planning as it stands at the moment? Okay, thank you. Um, I guess just a shout out for local boards as part of that conversation too. Um, you know, we have seen in the past some instances where local boards have wanted to hold on to something for a future use that isn't necessarily um, bought into by the rest of the organisation, but conversely they will actually also be very good judges of what they do need. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferry. Councillor Darby, please. Thanks, Mayor. Mayor, thanks for um, you know accepting and incorporating the reds. There's a bit more, but I, I'm that's I think that could be hard for all the councillors to follow without a print copy in front of them at, at some stage. Um, and now, just in my yeah underway, my, in terms of my questions, um, we're just dealing with financial strategy main budget levers, which includes the fiscal rules. The fiscal rules are. Um, further into your mayoral proposal. Are you going to cover fiscal rules after you cover, um, you know, well, Māori outcomes, water care, uh, financial strategy, or do you want to cover it now in the higher order? I think we're trying to get the, those things now, because the, the fiscal rules, um, which have been entirely absent, really, and that includes things like requiring um, benefit cost ratios and just, yep. just just some disciplines which the the government has, but we never did, and um, they don't actually directly impact immediately on the on the rates, but they will direct over a long period of time to kind of avoid us wandering into the situation where we've got ourselves in now. With if some of those fiscal rules have been available when we signed up the CRL, and it's interesting that people are worried about not having the full information ahead of them, but we all committed ourselves here to $5 billion worth of, of expenditure, only just discovering now that it's $220 million a year to run it. OK, on that note then, I guess it's a question for you, because I think there's a really good fiscal rule here under was your original pro, um, um, proposal at paragraph 20, and I've got your preliminary draft, but I don't think it's changed dramatically. And under cost-benefit analysis, which is what you're just referring to there, the general rule is that council should do things where the costs exceed the benefits. And the BCR, um, that is, BCR is lower than one. Um, I think it should be higher than one. Um, but I, I, my question of you, because your proposal has proposed reduced spending in some areas, are you applying that rule, which you're recommending, uh, in developing your proposal, where you have reduced funding, um, say between the AT capex 16 billion recommended to your 14 billion, are you applying your own recommended CBR rule, e.g., speed management, safety, uh, cycling? I'm, I mean the rule. I don't mean whether you like or dislike a raised crossing, I mean, are you actually applying the rule that you're recommending to us? Well, I'm hoping that the AT board would apply that rule to everything that they do. You can actually set a global sum based on what's available, and then within that, if you're going to send it, the way you'll prioritise things is to make sure that the things actually do meet a, and a BCR of one is pretty bloody low. I mean... Um, 
anything below one is throwing money away for no benefit. And so it's not a particularly tough one, but we have a lot of things that wouldn't come anywhere near meeting that. And the, and the, the benefit can be um, prior. If it's a social benefit, that, that can be given a value to ensure that it does meet that. It's a fairly basic, simple rule. It's like riding on the left-hand side of the road rather than the right. OK, look, can we take it then that that rule is applying to this current proposed budget? That, Be sure, and, yeah, and, I hope and it through does. The I mean, if there's anything we'll... in there that's not like that, I, I, I would want to know, but I'm not encouraging wasting money. OK, just a small one, and it is, it is small in the scheme of things. The proposed bike ferry uh, doesn't have a, a business case... Um, and it came before us through a public forum, and you're not suggesting that Auckland Transport allocate any spending to that. You're saying it should be investigated. Well, I'm hoping that the private enterprise will, if we announce that it's out there. I mean, before I got to be the mayor, I thought about putting it in myself. It's, uh, you know, it's a pretty good investment, actually. But, so it, um, it's, in your, it's mentioned in your proposal, but it's not in budget. Is that correct? There's no OPEX or CAPEX Not at this stage. Alloc but um, but if, if we've got a global $14 billion at AT, we haven't identified every dollar of that $14 billion that we're going to spend either. Not even close. So um, I just want the idea of it there. There's nothing stopping us putting out alternatives which seem to be cheap in solving solutions. And I can tell you it'll be a lot nearer a BC of one than a $600 million cycleway bridge over that was, which wouldn't have got into 0 0.0001, let alone one. So, here yeah, you can toss things up, but it, wouldn't, it won't happen unless it meets that. OK? OK, look, I don't want to dwell on that one, but it's unclear. Um, your staff are telling me that it's not funded, the investigation that could actually come out of the mayoral office budget. So I believe it, but it could, come out, of it some could of the... come out of the 14 billion, but we're already short on just getting our, you know, we've actually culled the spend on, say, Ferry uh, Enhanced Program 2B. That's been culled entirely, and this gets added in. So I'm, I just want some clarity on that. I think we just put out there that this is an opportunity and probably somebody out there in the, in the real world will probably think, well, that's worth doing, I'll do it. OK, external. Ex expectation is external. OK, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Councillor Hills, please. Thank you. Just on the, um, the general rules, um, what, what do they tie us into? Because I've experienced that COVID storms, cost of living crises, and potentially if we get the uh, fuel tax ripped off us and no change with water care, we, our budget will look extremely different. So how do we, how do we support rules that, that we've seen due to the changing nature of things have had you know, the 15% um, revenue, what was that, 15% interest? on revenue and the 1.5 above um, inflation. I'm just wondering what, what that ties us into. How does it affect our um, yeah, financial ability to borrow, etc.? So we're required to have um, prudence rules within our financial strategy. And as, as Ross mentioned earlier, you know, the, the purpose of a financial strategy is to, to um, provide a context and a guide for you to consider proposals going forward. So the, the purpose of that strategy is to provide a guide. I think um, in re, recontextualizing these rules or re, reshaping the rules, um, they enable the council to be more responsive to a changing economic environment. Um, for example, the, um, the proposal to um, move from numerically defined rates increases um, rates increase limits to um, ones that relate to inflation um, put us in a different position to where we were last LTP. So last LTP, we'd had it, you know, we said our limit was X, but we hadn't taken into account that inflation was going to go through the roof. By, by having limits that are, are related to an, an inflation metrics, it allows us to be more responsive to changes in the environment, the econ economic environment. But 
I suppose at the heart, the, the core is these rules are, are to be a guide in order for to support your decision making and ensure the council continues to operate in a prudent way. Thank you. So when, I guess, because obviously with the cost of living pressures and the inflation that we've had, that has affected our budget a lot. But when inflation's low, it's actually more building costs, staff and union um, agreements, borrowing and de depreciation. Those have been the effects in our rates. Why have we, is it prudent to choose inflation as a, as a focus when largely it has not been an overall effect on our it's been I popular. think it rises and falls, and then and this allows us to be, to it forces us to take aware of what it is. So if it's falling, well, that debt will that that would encourage council to be a bit more cautious about increasing. If it's rising, then that's. I, I think it was a bit unfortunate that um, the previous councils got into the habit of thinking that interest rates will always be two percent and um, inflation will always be two and a half percent, when they suddenly got out. of jumped, we were unprepared for that. And the point here is that if by adding those in, you are, it doesn't restrict our ability to make decisions. It puts them in a context that we should be thinking about those things as well. I guess that's my point, Mayor, is that when inflation is low, if it, if it gets low, like last time we had extremely high population growth, which was a completely different need of funding. And if the government takes one of the very few tools we have, the regional fuel tax, that may dramatically affect next year's budget differently. So I'm just wanting to understand how they tie us in and if they don't take other, you know, do we take all those changes into account? Do we have to then approve new policy? How does that work? Um, so the council would need to make a conscious decision to breach those rules. So you would need to resolve to um, specifically that a rates increase would be above the limit within your financial strategy. Um, and and council has done that in the past, and, you know, emergency budgets and things like that. I suppose the other thing with using an inflation-pegged um, rates increase limit, as, as the Mayor's proposed, is, um, one, it's, um, that's generally how most other councils do this, um, but also it takes into account a, a more of an affordability aspect, so it looks at it from the other side and from the, the, the ratepayers' perspective as well. Thank you. Thank you. That. Councillor Watson, please. Didn't have a question. Sorry about that. Uh, Councillor Walker. Um, so um, I've just got a couple of questions around, you know, the financial strategy and a budget lever. If we, if we accept that our development contributions are effectively a budget lever, that would be correct, Mr Tucker? Um, yes and no. The, the development contributions are a cost recovery tool. Sure. So you have to set the capital budget first and then use it as a recovery tool. It's not a one that you can uh, necessarily oh, set I understand directly. that. Um, if, we, if we further accept that because we're under-recovering for development contributions, let's say we've got 10,000 uh, homes a year and we're under covering by um, 60,000. That's 600 million a year over 10 years. You know, that tracks at 6 billion. If we accept that that is part of the structural problem, why we are at in the financial situation we face today, what um, scenarios, what options are we putting in this long-term plan, given that it's a 10-year plan, to address that issue in terms of increasing the contribution so that growth is paying its fair share? So our current development contribution policy um, seeks to recover a fair share of growth costs from developers, but you know, it has to work within current legislation. So it is you know, generally only a partial, you know, a, a share, a partial recovery of growth costs. Um, you know, in terms of you know, what we could do going forward and what we might signal, um, you know, in the financial strategy is, is that, you know, longer term, there are other mechanisms, other funding tools, which would require, you know, working government support, legislative type change. So it could be enhancement to development contribution legislation, or it could be new funding tools, um, you know, shares of GST and all those kind of things. So the financial strategy um, could call out some of those longer term um, 
things that could be done with support of central government, and a number of those things are called out in the, the Mayor's manifesto. So, just a supplementary question. In the commentary as it goes to the long-term plan, are we informing the public with the sort of at least back of the envelope figures that I've generated, you know, six billion over ten years, six hundred million that we're under recovering, and arguably it's it's worse than that. Are we informing the public around that so that they are in a position to know? Irrespective of whether we can move it or not because of government legislation or whatever, can we give people that information? So in the financial strategy, we'll talk at a high, high level about what are the financial challenges the council's facing, what are the drivers from it. So we'll do the best we can with the information that we can put in there um, and that we can back up with, with auditable evidence. So the intention is for the financial strategy to spell out what the problems are and what some of the future solutions might be. Good point, uh, Councillor. So I had another uh, question, Mr Chair, and it, and it goes to the big initiatives. Um, and it, it goes to financial strategy. If we accept that um, climate change is one of the most significant issues that we should be exercising, is it, is it possible to have something in our um, key initiatives, particularly that goes to a situation where what we want to do is reduce emissions faster, bigger, and as economically as possible? and the economically as possible goes to the financial strategy and also goes to the type of methodology that the Mayor is suggesting around some form of criteria like benefit cost. And the reason that I'm asking that is I believe in many instances our emissions are going slower, far more expensive than what they could be otherwise, and nowhere near enough. So my question is around the merit, and the Mayor might answer this in addition, of having something like that as a lever. Uh, I'll have a bit of a crack at that. I mean, um, for those of us who endured the yesterday's audit meeting, um, I eh? I didn't, I wasn't there. No, we, for those of us who endured, we, we were put through the ringer from um, the Auditor General and their, our own staff about the detailed reporting were associated with the very items that you've raised, so that we will have to really, all of us will know much better what our position is with regard to greenhouse gases and the costs associated with that. So we will take those in. That, that whole sector is learning its way to a degree. Um, um, if you want to know more, you're welcome to endure the next meeting of the Audit Committee and take my place. Supplementary question, Mr Mayor. I mean, given that, given that the government is obligated to meet emissions targets, given that this council is obligated to meet emissions targets, given that this council has significant leverage as to how Auckland delivers its overall emissions targets, and there are costs associated with this, that flow to the economy and will flow to council if we do not meet those emissions, is it not appropriate to have such a criteria as I'm suggesting so that we actually do it? Because otherwise, it's not happening. Our emissions are actually tracking up. I'll just ask the staff to answer, but yesterday we were addressed in a manner which shows that we are tracking it pretty pretty well. Who was there at that meeting? It went on for ages. Um, do you want to, I mean, we are definitely doing that. It's not actually a strategy of mine, it's just a way that they are fulfilling the requirements of both the NZX, list, NZX listing and the requirements of the government. But there's no question we, we are definitely measuring them. And if I add the substance of the question, I think, is around the investment analysis we've done and how it uh, attaches to climate. Uh, so there is material provided within the staff advice. Um, that staff advice um, uh, on about page 121 around the uh, investment impact assessment. It does look at the uh, the middle scenario, the core scenario, and a lower and high scenario and what that will mean for um, 
climate priorities, um, helpfully coloured in green, um, and the impact on those over a, a three-year horizon of both capex and opex. So I think the, the question, um, just to reflect back, uh, the analysis and data is behind there for you to take that lens into account in your decision making. Thank you very much for that, Council Newman, please. Good morning. Um, thank you. Uh, the, I just came back to the, um, the broader um, financial covenants, the budget levers and settings that we're talking about for this budget. Um, Council Hills sort of alluded to this in terms of um, um, changing landscape, future impacts. I think he's right there. What we do know is, well, we've got a signal in relation to a major funding change with regional fuel tax and we can anticipate that there would be a significant change with the GPS on land transport. We'll come to that, the transport section. But my question really is, I mean, with the um, financial covenants that we're talking about in this budget, uh, what's our capacity to pivot to subsequent changes that we know are forthcoming, particularly in the transport space? If the GPS sets out a, a, a number of scenarios whereby we are not enjoying the sort of funding support that we anticipated that will inevitably have a consequence for our overall group budget for which we will need to make a subsequent adjustment. Beyond um, the proposals in this mayor, um, proposal that Mayor has, has presented, is there enough capacity to be able to pivot um, or do we have to have a, quite a significant rewrite again um, next financial year because actually we didn't have the capacity built in to withstand any changes that we get from that forthcoming GPS. So, so our, our budget will need to disclose all of our um, significant forecasting assumptions and, and further to the question from Councillor Filipina. Um, all those forecasting assumptions will be disclosed along with the levels of uncertainty and the impacts of those uncert that uncertainty. So in, in the examples that you've just given, um, where we one of the key forecasting assumptions that we've, we've always included is our assumption around government support for transport investment. Um, the level of that uncertainty, I think we would, we would flag as high. Um, and in the impact there, we would need to be clear in our consultation material um, as to the, the choices that would or the, the impact that could have on the level of investment um, available to, tra to Auckland Transport and the choices that would come back to, you, to yourselves around either um, looking to fund that from elsewhere or looking to reduce the level of investment in transport. And just to add to that, so the proposal in front of you today is to go out to consultation with a broad um, scope of options in terms of the, the um, Spend, spend more, uh, get more, etc., uh, and uh, and spend less, get less. So those broad range of um, of options would give you lots of scope to make changes between the the draft and final, um, based off new information and based off what the the public uh, tell you about their preferences on this budget proposal. So we would say there's quite a bit of scope um, to make changes as as things evolve. Um, after you set a final budget in June, um, these uh, parameters in the financial strategy, you know, they're not hard financial covenants, they are more sort of guidelines, they are uh, indicative guidelines that you create expectations with the public. So the, the intention of having you know, rates, rates increases of no more than 1.5% above CPI inflation is uh, an expectation. Um, it doesn't mean you're constrained and can't go above it, you just have to be very transparent about moving above that. So there will be flexibility um, uh, to, to, to make changes going forward that might require some future consultation. Um, what is probably more, more constraining is things like debt limits. Um, so it's important to have enough debt headroom to give you the capacity to move. But some of the parameters we're talking about here, you know, they're, they're not hard and fast rules. And if there is an emergency where things change, as long as you're transparent with the public, there, there is flexibility to adjust and adapt. Good question. Thank you, Councillor Fuller. 
Kia ora, thank you, Your Worship. And you just answered my question, actually. I was just going to ask you to clarify that these rules are just guidelines, as you've said, um, so they're not binding on us. And ultimately, the decision then is always with us, the governing body. Um, and if we need to, if there's a big shock like another COVID, um, then we can uh, make a decision based on those circumstances. So thank you for that. Um, I was going to ask, though, about reducing our net operating costs. I know that we're always trying to tighten our belts, and we've just gone through a huge process of doing that as an organisation. And what I hear from our staff and from people on the ground is that, you know, they've really reduced and we're down to the bone. Is there really much scope left to reduce any further? Is there much trim, fat left to trim? And if so, what sorts of numbers are we looking at in terms yeah. of jobs? I can't comment specifically in terms of jobs. Um, others might want to comment on that element. In, in terms of you know how how hard or difficult is it to find further savings? So yeah, you know, I think you're, you're right. There's always the opportunity to over time do more, be efficient, increase productivity. But given the uh, the large uh, savings targets that have been added into the budget year after year, and then particularly the large ones through the annual budget, it's getting tougher and tougher to reduce operating spend without creating impacts on services and, and impacts for the community. So in, in the um, proposal in front of you, there are some targets there, and there is you know, some, some savings targets for transport that are quite large in year one, and they will talk to those in the next part of it. And then you know, across the rest of the group, there are some, um, some large targets that go to you know, increase 50 million over and above existing targets by the third year of the plan and, uh, and, and the staff advice that sort of spelt out what some of those impacts are. Um, there will be things that are noticeable and it will mean we can do less and have to prioritise. Um, the, the view is that might be tough and implementation might, may be a little, little, little risky and challenging and require close attention and hard work and we'll have to give some things up. In terms of the, the do less, um, do less, pay less scenario, if you get rates closer to inflation, those will have to be much bigger and there will have to be more you know, radical adjustments to services that people will notice over time that that is the consequence of trying to get rates down is you know, there will, the, the impacts of those cuts will be much more severe and the consultation materials will have to be pretty uh, clear about that. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fuli. There are all, I mean, things like um, shifting Iki Panuku into our offices is a saving that didn't actually reduce any services. So there's always things you can be looking for. And we're asking, asking our contractors to find better, faster ways of doing things. So I think organisations continuously move for improvement, even really good ones. Um, the next person is Councillor Turner. Thank you. Just just on the basis of the debate I'm listening to and... and um, so these climate change costs and our actions around, built around this have huge effect or potential effect. And, you know, from what I've heard, and I can't see anything different, we're making an assumption um, that climate change is... Um, has to be addressed. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't, but when you hear the figures that we've been told in other meetings, the astonishing figures we were told for implementing the vehicle kilometres reduction target, etc. And at that meeting, I made the point that we would have to stimulate the economy by two trillion dollars over ten years in order for people to make enough money to pay the rates needed to come up with the figure that we were told. So th that, for me, is huge huge variations in here that that we that aren't aren't sort of looked at like we I, I see I was the one who challenged the Auditor General about our measurement of carbon. I see the Auditor General's office has said that they are going to take a random selection of councils and uh, review how they how they measure their carbon um, outcomes. I, I just think we're missing some rules here on how we're going to measure this stuff. Because if we get this wrong over 10 years, it could have billions of dollars worth of ch change. Uh, yesterday's, you went there at the audit meeting, 
what we've learned is that you don't want to be at the head of the queue in this. There's a lot of ways to measure these things, so I'll be moving cautiously ahead behind everybody else. I'll make sure I'm the next one, Mr Mayor. Sorry. Um, Helen, would you like to um, talk to this um, just briefly around the measurement issues? Yes, kia ora koutou. Um, so we already measure our operational scope one, two and three emissions. Um, so those are our in direct and indirect emissions. Um, the Audit New Zealand will be, because we have to prepare climate statements under the climate disclosure legislation, they will anyway have to audit um, our greenhouse gas emissions. And we are in the process of beginning to measure our emissions at the group level. And as part of this, we will be setting a policy as to how we calculate greenhouse gas emissions moving forward. Um, so that's clear across the group and it's clear with Audit New Zealand as well. Okay, that's all I've got on this one here. We're going to move to transport for questions now, and the transport um, thing will go to the top, and I'll bring forward to the table who he was going to answer that. Is there anybody in the staff who's going to answer these things? I think we might be online for transport. We've got some online ones. Ah, there we are. Yep. Gentlemen from a the AT team are there, and it's basically we've put some pressure on AT and they've responded very well. Uh, AT had initially had their hand out for the biggest increase from year to year and they still have but it's not quite as big as what it was. And this is again where we're balancing things. This is a typical case of buy more and spend more or buy less and spend less. And we're trying to hit the uh, sweet spot in the middle where they're doing a good amount of what we want without actually stinging our public too, too, too badly. And Councillor Henderson's got a question. Several, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, so thank you for joining us, AT. Do you have an indicative breakdown of the proposed 70 million in operating budget cuts at this stage? Uh, good morning, Councillor. That was covered largely in those workshop um, conversations. Uh, it was, I can't remember which was the last one, um, but it's essentially the last breakdown you saw, which was the middle column. But we can circulate it again if it's helpful. Um, and working with the Mayor's Office, I believe there's essentially been one change to that, that spreadsheet um, since then, in terms of where we'd see the proposed savings coming from. Um, so, I don't know if you want to go into the specifics of it now. or Yeah, I, just a few specifics, if you don't mind. Um, is there a figure uh, tagged to reducing bus services? Um, yes, so as per the last workshop we're in, there was approximately 10 million uh, reduction in the council funding tag for bus services. Uh, that number, if you remember, we talked about four different sort of items within that. It was a number of items about potential redirection of some of the CATA funding more flexibly around that. Other ideas such as taking off um, potentially some of the lowest performing buses, etc. Um, but, but that piece of work, just to be really clear, and what we've agreed is we, we'll go away and do a very, once there's a, a firm agreement around what's the funding envelope in that space, we'll go away and do a detailed piece of work over the next couple of weeks so that there's a, an informed view that goes out in the, the mural proposal document um, for consultation that, that suggests where those um, savings could be found. And to put it into context, if there was, if you assume that there was no redirecting of CATA, you're talking about a 4% reduction in bus costs when you take into account co-funding. Um, but it's not necessarily a 4% reduction in services to, if you were to go up to some of the lower performing ones. That kind of gives you a magnitude of size. Uh, but, but again, we don't want to do a knee jerk piece of work here that comes up with a specific list for today. It's more the principle that we're agreeing that there's going to be some ongoing, whether you want to call it optimization, or there will be some trimming of existing, um, is how I frame it for the purpose of the LTP conversation. Okay, thank you. I'll direct. Um councillors to look to check out Nexus where there is uh, some detail in terms of the lower fare box recovery routes. Um, and thank you for preparing that, by the way. That, that was really helpful. I note that most of those are rural or feeder routes. Um, is AT taking into account things like congestion charging and uh, $50 a week fare cap and the cost of public transport? And 
looking at uh, letting things breathe before cutting bus routes? Is that a principle that you're taking into account? In, yeah, in terms of a principle we're taking into account, yeah. obviously we've talked about the public transport growth program. So that, that does remain a key focus for us in terms of that, because of course if we are investing in public transport, making it reliable and then increasing ridership, that's going to help the financial equation of everybody. And so that is the, the key focus is to you know constantly look and improve and make sure our services are reliable so we're attracting customers to use them in the first place. So we do have that obviously that's been to councillors in terms of that and has has that support more broadly. But in terms of looking at the bus network and optimizing it and looking at the opportunities to do so, we do that consistently and constantly as well. Okay, thank you. I've got a couple more. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so in terms of optimising those bus routes, um, I'm aware that there's still large parts of our city with limited or no provision, and places like uh, Upper Harbour come to mind. The local board did a fantastic presentation there. Um, also, regional parks, places like Piha. Uh, does that optimisation look at cutting routes merely, or does it look at adding routes uh, in line with the congestion charging regime? For the purpose of this conversation, we've been looking at reductions, and that may not mean a full route reduction, it might mean a frequency reduction. So we are not looking at this stage in order to be able to increase to some of those other areas within this proposal. Okay, I've got two more. Um, so thanks as well for providing that data on the cost of public transport fares as you go further out. Um, so for those colleagues that may not have had the chance to check that out, uh, could you just give your thoughts on the cost of public transport in Auckland as you go further out in relation to other cities in New Zealand and Australia? It, it, look, it really, it really varies in terms of the cost of delivery depending on that what I'll call the route length and in terms of that and the ridership and the frequency. So how we compare both locally as well as internationally, again, it varies and it all depends on terms of how public transport is funded within various regions and whether there is and what type of contractual mechanisms are in place. So in terms of nationally, where we come in with what I'll call a fare box recovery is pretty good. So Auckland fares reasonably well in comparison to Greater Wellington and Environment Canterbury in terms of the cost of public transport delivery. So when we look at our peers in terms of other cities, again, it's quite a different in terms of how they do it. And so they all vary in terms of that, but it's reasonable to expect that the cost ratio is very similar. Sorry, sorry it's just a follow up to the previous question because I'm not sure it was answered um, quite closely enough for my liking, apologies. Um, as you go further out, right, so you go past 15 kilometres from a city centre, what is our uh, cost for public transport compared to other comparator cities? Okay, so apologies, councillor, I misinterpreted your, your question. So in terms of that, the further out you get, the more expensive it is for a customer. So our strategy has been in recent years in order to be able to put what I call minimal fare uplift the further out you get in order to make it more cost effective for those customers that have longer journeys. Okay, um, so last question. Thank you, Mayor, for your, your forbearance. Um, are we looking at, in terms of dynamic lane trials and dynamic lane proposals, uh, arterials that may face cuts or reductions to the capital work program as a priority? Places like Lincoln Road. Yeah. So, sorry, I can't, I'm just struggling, Councillor, quite with a specific question. Are you? So, so when you're looking at dynamic lanes, how are you prioritising which ones you're going to do, and would you take into account the fact that um, there are capex proposals along arterials that have been cut? <laughs> um, it's a, it's a, sorry, now I get the question. So. I guess I'd almost treat them a little bit differently. If you take Lincoln Road as an example, it's a highly complex corridor with lots of intersections. Personally, I think that is a difficult case for dynamic laning, it's my personal view. Um, but the team are going away and methodically working through route by route. Um, a practical one with dynamic laning is the number of gantries you need over intersections and the like. It, the more intersections you have, it's diff more difficult to do dynamic laning. If you think of Lincoln Road and the construct of it, um, it is a more complex corridor. 
um, I would treat that as a separate question from. So we would do dynamic learning as a separate question from how you capital might. Improvements. Yeah, major capital improvements. And, and the likes of which Lincoln Road do become they're far more expensive because of the complexity. Right, I see. Thank you, Matt. I think we want to do that where it makes the most good rather than anything else. Mm. Uh, Councillor Ferret. Uh, thanks. Quite convenient to um, carry on there from uh, those questions about Lincoln Road because I note that the Lincoln Road corridor improvements, which are part of the regional fuel tax projects, are um, on the list to go in the $16 billion budget that AT's put forward. So I um, wondered if you have a comment on that and the fact that there's a number, quite a number of um, regional fuel tax projects, uh, New North Road, um, some bus and Crosstown stuff, and the 16 billion, and then I'll come back to the 14 billion uh, in a moment. But uh, what's the rationale there? You've just told us how complex that corridor is. Um, Sounds like it needs some improvements. It's a great question, but again, if you kind of come back to, I guess, one of the, the, the key, I guess, pieces of it, uh, I guess, shaping we've been asked to do around the long-term plan is let's not do lots of more expensive projects and if you start applying that lens to if you kind of started going through the list we know there's some urban cycleway projects need to finish which are quite expensive but if you then start talking about um, the likes of Lincoln Road or New North some of, some of the cost of those projects are getting towards above 150 towards 200 million dollars and so if you bring it back to that VCR type conversation um, the VCRs you know, get challenging, but also at the same point, it's an overall affordability question there. And is that money within a 14 billion program better spent elsewhere or not? Plan is, I guess, those projects that are over 100 million in cost that were, you know, largely sort of connected with connected communities type program and some of those specific corridor improvements. Okay, I'm, I'm interested in your comment there about the BCRs. I'd, I'd quite like to see a bit more information on that because I suspect some of these probably have quite favourable BCRs, but um, you can come back on that later. Um, the $14 billion stuff, um, so, I mean, in noting this is um, more what the Mayor's asked you to trim to than the $16 billion, um, you know, we're cutting out a whole lot, again, of projects that are in the regional fuel tax. Acknowledging we know the future of the regional fuel tax is a little uncertain at the moment, but we have consulted on... <coughs> charging this regional fuel tax to do these projects. So I'm really concerned to see so many cut um, in what's being put forward. While at this point, we are still operating under the regional fuel tax and we still have to deliver projects that we consulted and said we would do. So, um, you know, for example, there's supporting, um, supporting EVs. Uh, a very modest amount of only $11 million over 10 years, that's cut. Um, Waiheke's 10-year transport program, an another very modest amount, but in the RFT and cut. Um, Druru local improvements, northwest growth, Auckland um, housing project, project, sorry, housing program projects, which has a significant trim. So what's the thinking there? Um, well, I think that just reflects the fact that there's a whole range of tasks uh, that we could be doing um, in a limited amount of funding, so we, we need to make choices. Um, and we are reflecting on what's gone into the $14 billion uh, program. Uh, some of those, as we've heard, as Mark just said, the key priorities that we've received from Council um, about ensuring our existing program um, and, and existing networks renew, uh, emphasis on smaller projects and such. Uh, in terms of the regional fuel tax, uh, absolutely, we're, we're well aware that we consulted, or sorry, rather, council collectively consulted on um, the regional fuel tax uh, proposal back in 2021. However, there's been a significant increase in cost in that overall program, so we couldn't afford to do all of those projects anyway that were listed in the regional fuel tax order in council within the amount of funding that is provided um, by that. Uh, that program now anyway. So that in any event, there will be a need to um, make choices about what got funded and uh, and, 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 and so we need to make uh, changes there in any case. Uh, so we're reflecting within that the kind of priorities that we've received from the Mayor's proposal and Council. Okay, there's, there's a couple of contradictions in there about 
you know, looking at stuff that's small, but also things that are over 100 million. So anyway, I guess we, we debate this through the process. Um, I don't feel particularly enlightened from that conversation, but uh, thank you for attempts. Um, three other aspects um, that aren't to do with the regional fuel tax and those um, project lists. Um, the first is uh, I wanted to get some certainty around um, the whether the gold card use off peak in the evening is uh, is intended to continue under this budget, or is that something that's intended to be um, cut? Noting that it doesn't have central government subsidy. Asking for ALF, yeah. Um, so based on conversations in the last few days, the, my understanding is the mural proposal is essentially what was loaded in that last workshop materials with one exception, which is that the removal of the gold card in the after, super gold card in the afternoon peak has not been cut. And the suggestion is that in return that five million is effectively funded, if I was to call it that, or offset in our proposed cost reductions of um, lower track access type costs. What's it? Within the broader PT suite of costs. So, to answer your question, it's, I understand the middle proposal, it's no longer proposed. Okay. It was one of the ideas that was put up, but it's not on the bait. So, it's not on the middle proposal. It would still be in the downside scenario. Okay, thank you. Um, the amount for level crossings, um, this seems well under what we actually need. Is that because we're relying on a deal with central government for the rest of the funding? I think in short answer terms, yes, this is setting aside some money to effectively get on with the business case and the detailed design, etc. Just planning. planning, but it won't fund, what, you know, again, in broad numbers, it's about 600 million required for that tranche and around Tekinini, and I think we've set aside about four of those specific ones, was 100, yeah, 130 or something, actually. Out of the 180 odd well, that's been set aside. Yeah, I think it's something we could stand to make a little bit more transparent to the community that the funding we have now is probably all going to be spent on that Takanini area. Um, and there's actually a whole lot of other sites we need to do as well, um, particularly on the Western Line. Okay, um, then I've got some questions around these bus routes. So this information you gave us with the, um, the uh, low fee box recovery and the low utilisation. Um, that's really useful data, um, and thank you. I know some of us have been asking for that for a while. Um, is there any consideration, obviously you've given us just the raw numbers, um, but it would be helpful to understand some of these routes, You know, for example, the airport link and the 38, which also serves the airport, you know, they have functions above and beyond um, fee box recovery. Uh, and, you know, is that part of the consideration? Um, yeah. Absolutely, Councillor. So the, the initial approach was to provide in terms of those low fee box recovery routes for visibility in terms of where they sit, but of course some do have a strategic uh, necessity for the network and for that inclusion part, particularly when you look at the likes of the airport link. Okay, I think also it would be helpful to maybe have some conversations with local boards. Um, I mean, obviously the airport in 38 sort of leaps out at you um, as having regional significance as a sort of a, almost a utility line, if you know what I mean. That's probably the wrong word. Um, but some of the other ones, you know, so for example, I know um, the 670, a bit about that because it's in, in the area I used to cover on the local board, but there'll be others that I don't understand the importance of. So I think we need to get some input from local boards around those. Um, I note that um, there's two lines there that are on Waiheke, and um, I think they probably are in a similar category in terms of, um, you know, serving some utility above and beyond fair box recovery. I, I, I totally take on board what you're saying, Councillor, and I guess the way we're thinking about it is obviously we want to do, go away and do a very careful, considered piece of work on this and not jump straight to solutions in a short space of time. Um, the team will do that work, obviously, with a, if you do the crude mass, if we're going to take 10 out of services it's, with co-funding, it's about 20 mil. Um, there are going to be some difficult choices in there. There will be some that communities don't like, to be frank, um, but that's, you know, that's the work that we're being asked to do as part of you know, helping cut our cost to help deal with council's funding constraints. Um, and we do um, get a level of 
can I just say, that, um, I don't want to interfere the debate, but we count, we, we're going out to consult on kind of the big picture, 14 billion or 16 billion, rather than each route. Um, I think that we've had some uh, um, workshops on the detailed routing, and we will have more later on when we know back whether we've got 14 billion or 16 billion or 12 billion to spend. And so, um, carry on, but uh, we, we're getting deeply into the weeds here. Um, sure. I would note, I appreciate that. I would note this is the first time, um, just in the last couple of days, that we've had this information on the bus routes. Um, I Except just that, have and one, I'm sure we will be yeah. going through that as a sure. result of this. But um, That's primarily what I'm seeking, is some reassurance that we are going to have those conversations. And yeah, I probably could be a bit more um, succinct about that. But I do have one last one, um, which is one of those identified as an on-demand service. So are we looking at that in terms of are there other on-demand services that are working? Is this an on-demand service that's quite new? It's not one I'm familiar with. Is this sort of one out of the box, or are we saying we have an ongoing issue with the on-demand ones that they may not be, as a, as a tool, it may not be working? I think, Councillor, on-demand ha definitely has its purpose in the network, particularly when you're looking at greenfields opportunities and building up demand, and the, and the year after being replaced by a bus service, it does have a much higher cost ratio. And uh, But they have proved their work in use of what I would say is bringing up public transport use and for something else and then be moved on. So as far as what I would call the long-term sustainability of an on-demand service, I think we actually as AT need to look a bit broader in terms of how we create those first legal, last league sort of opportunities and on-demand opportunities outside of the traditional model we have been doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walker, please. A couple of um, short questions. Um, one on the uh, savings that might accrue from um, more efficient temporary traffic management that the Mayor is um, keen on. So is, is Auckland Transport going to be quantifying that and quantifying the amount of savings that we could receive so that Aucklanders have that information and in what we go out with? And that might include uh, more effective uh, project uh, planning and project uh, management and the use of technology as other cities use for this and certainly a dramatic reduction in the number of cones. So any response to that? Um, the temporary traffic management was covered in the OPEC savings that we discussed at the confidential workshops. Um, obviously the focus at the moment has been on I guess what I call year one and that's what we've largely been discussing um, but obviously there's scope and to potentially in those, some of those outer years or into more interim years to potentially look at pushing some of those revenues higher. But it, it's definitely in that material you've seen. Um, I just wouldn't propose we go into more detail on it today unless people want to. So, so you're saying the detail is there? Okay, and the other question I have uh, just goes to some detail around the amount of savings we could get from an, uh, enforcing fare evasion, which is from my understanding, very significant cost to the region. Um, again, if you remember, there was a green list we put up in one of the workshops that it literally listed out all of these types of options and the, the fear evasion one um, is coming back and it, and it is about, we've, we've estimated around $2 million net per year, which is about $4 million gross when you take a look at the no funding, but that's also net of the cost of actually putting the transport officers out to assist with that, and it has additional safety benefits. So it's actually something we are recommending that we want to do, and it, and it does contribute to helping close some of the, the funding gap. So that's in. Yes, it is in. Good question. Good answer, Councillor Darby. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Um, firstly, um, to you, I think, Mark. Um, what, uh, going back to the revenue generating opportunities that you, the board, uh, sanctioned and, and you sent through to us at our request that was part of the SOI that we asked you to present um, some opportunities that we could consider to generate revenues, is it only the one that relates to the gold card in the afternoon that has not been picked up? All the others have been accepted 
in, in this proposal? Uh, correct. Okay, good. Uh, Stacey, to you. Um, the residential speed management program has been reduced from the AT recommended in the 16 billion program to the mayor's proposal um, in the 14 billion program, CapEx for transport. Um, and it goes from 49.3 to zero. How does that, and uh, there's also a 30% reduction in the road safety uh, budget, that's down 82.4, and the safe speeds budget is down 34.3, both those are about minus 30%. How, how does that impact um, what Auckland Transport and Auckland Katahi term the uh, deaths and serious injury equivalents saved per year? Um, you know, well, I, I guess fundamentally, are fewer Aucklanders going to make it home uh, under that proposal, or the same, or more? So, that deaths and serious injury equivalents saved per year, what happens in that space? Yep. Against a trajectory, uh, Councillor, obviously it is, does reduce the situation in terms of what we had anticipated in order to be able to meet our targets. So it sorry, is obviously it, you, a considerable you, change to the base program. Sorry, you broke up initially there, Stacey. Can you just go again, please? That means that with less investment in the programs, that the actual anticipation of DSI reduction is reduced. So therefore, more people will potentially be seriously injured or die on our roads. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, probably back to you, Mark, or maybe Hamish. There's, an, there's another budget line uh, new to me, um, unplanned natural events. Um, it goes in the $16 billion AT recommended program to the Mayor's proposal. It goes uh, minus 94. It was, was 94 in your recommendation, 94.9, and it goes to zero. Uh, can you just explain what that is and what the implications are, please? And um, the second part in the same area, city centre access for everyone is reduced from 79.9 million to zero. Uh, we've just con confirmed last week the city centre action plan, which uh, includes that. Uh, so what are the movement and congestion implications of that decision? Those two areas, please. Thank you. Um, just more broadly, that first one was us wanting to start setting aside money for climate change adaptation, from my, from my recollection around, if you think of the weather events we had in earlier this year, starting to make a provision as we move forward. But Tony might be able to give something more specific. Oh, no, that's exactly it. It was a provision for... Um, future events, basically, um, to be used to either improve the resilience of our network or to, or to uh, cater for repairs from future events. Uh, you know, by, by reducing this line, we are uh, basically managing a higher level of risk in, in yeah. our planning. And so it's probably worth, if you bring it back to some of the initial comments around the long-term plan, it, it's fantastic that there's a far bigger focus on renewals and maintenance and looking after what we've got in terms of the core renewals program. But it, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe it sets aside a material amount of cash um, to deal to future events. And it's just something that we will need to be aware of. So should another major future event occur and it need needs funding, there would need to be a discussion about how to provision that within our plan. Okay, so you so were relying, you were relying on that line that. to uh, allow you to respond to re resilience issues, and that line is now no longer there. Correct. Okay, can I go to the city centre action, um, or access for, access, city centre access for everyone reduction from 79.9 to zero? Uh, yes, I mean, that's an, another one of those programs, and, you know, um, there throughout the $16 billion um, that when you when you do the prioritisation that's taken into account the direction in the Mayor's proposal, uh, that we're just not able to fund within the um, within the $14 billion cap. Um, I mean, this is one of the, the key trade-offs in that we've been able to allocate more towards things like dynamic bus lanes, um, route optimisation, 
and uh, some some of those sorts of things. So there are trade offs in, inherent to making these decisions to stay within a within a budget line. I, I get that. I'm asking you what the implications of no budget line for um, access for everyone on say movement of vehicles, people uh, through the city centre and congestion. Well, the, you, you know, clearly we, we wouldn't realise the benefits of that uh, uh, project that are expected within the city centre uh, in terms of those kinds of changes in high pedestrianisation and, and organisation of the city centre. So, um, yeah, that that's the implication. Almighty. Councillor Philippine. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, thank you to Councillor Ferry around these gold card question oh this yes thank you um because this was interesting enough i've um got my first seniors letter um so that was great reading for december my question is going to be on the raised platforms and it's um i think it's number 94 i'm just checking my notes um yep uh 95 and it's um, uh, saving the budget at least 80 million. Can you tell me that the raised platforms that have been mentioned in 95 in the mayoral proposal that includes pedestrian raised platforms for pedestrian crossings and speed bumps, are there any others that I've missed? Uh, that's, that's the main line that includes that, yes. There will be some other. Um, projects throughout the list that might include a raised table, but uh, or might have include a raised, included a raised table, um, but the, the bulk of them would be in that line. And if, if this goes through after consultation, if this goes through, um, does that mean that the uh, raised platforms that are currently in particular with pedestrian crossings, uh, will they be removed or a cheaper alternative to ensure that they are still raised? Not aware of us planning to remove any that have been no. placed. We're not anticipating that. Uh, sorry, I, maybe I stuffed up on that question. I'm talking, if that goes through, will there be any further raised platforms in particular with pedestrian crossings? I didn't mean that we remove the ones that are currently there, if that's the implication. Um, our understanding is that, well, sorry, the, the way we've interpreted this is there would be uh, avoiding raised speed tables uh, in the safety program that would impact on arterials. So there's still, um, you know, the, the way we thought about it um, is that uh, for, say, traffic calming and such uh, on local roads um, outside of the arterials, that, that, that kind of thing might go ahead. Um, and in, in key priority areas, but the current assumption is that uh, yeah, we'd be avoiding raised speed tables on the arterial network. Okay, so okay, may, may, yeah. So that means that uh, any future pedestrian crossings, as a res if this goes through, will not be raised. Can I just clarify that? I need to know that one. Not, not necessarily. If there's, if you give you an example, Rand, if there's a particular school where there's really strong support and there's support from the local board and community, and there's a very compelling, going back to the BCR comment earlier, um, strong community support for it in certain circumstances, I think we would still do them, but it's quite selective. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chair, just on the regional fuel tax, you mentioned that um, with the budget, well, with the uh, increase in prices for the projects that um, some of them may not be going ahead um, with even with the regional fuel tax being allocated. So two questions. Number one, will those funds that we've already received be reallocated to other projects um, on a needs basis as a result? And I'll ask the second question. Uh, the intent would be that we, um, the regional fuel tax that we um, have uh, 
uh, in terms of the, the sort of surplus that's built up because of um, and uh, the future revenue that we're expecting would still be allocated to projects within the uh, regional fuel tax order and council uh, consistent with the direction that we're receiving from um, the council and the mayor's proposal. However, we just won't be able to do as many of them as originally anticipated. And the key becomes the date at which regional fuel tax is removed. Yeah, that, that's assuming it remains in place. Yeah, so 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 that was going to be my, my last question, Chair, and that is, I know it's we'll have to wait until the coalition government ends up making a decision, but is there any time frame around that have you that have been indicated to you about when those funds could possibly cease? No, not at the moment. I, um, sorry, it's getting some feedback, but um, we understand the government wants to proceed with the legislative change, but the key will be the, the effective date of the removal. And it's, I don't know if someone in the, the mayor's office or might be closer to any conversations around that, but I, I just don't know in a public forum it's appropriate for us to comment much further. I'm sure there's negotiations and conversations going on. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, we don't know the answer to that. Councillor Hills, please. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mayor. I was going to ask about the 94 million, so that's um, adaptation, so that's done by Councillor Darby. The other question I have, um, and no offence to my colleague here, Councillor Sayers, I do want to understand how we got a 300% increase in the unsealed roads budget when other areas have been significantly decreased. And so where that, how that came in, going from 40 million to 124, but also if we're looking at buses with, you know, thousands of people on them looking to be cut, and you've got projects that have, and no offence to those people who live there, obviously, but if you've got five or six people living on a, on a road, how do you judge the need between, and I know they're capital OPEX, I'm not trying to conflate the two, but if you're looking at removing feeder services of a few thousand people, but you might reseal a road for several million with, you know, six homes on them, how are we, how are we testing that? Um, I think, as you pointed out, uh, one's CapEx and one's OPEX, so we can't easily transfer between the two. Um, but the the uh, decision on unsealed roads comes from the Mayor's proposal. Uh, clearly, uh, there's a whole different set of circumstances um, around unsealed roads and that there's provision for safety. Um, and I suspect that will be some of those routes will be serving, um, you know, a lot more than just five or six uh, households. And there's some wider impacts. I mean, the unsealed roads program has had, uh, you know, a long saga. And in, in previous RLTPs, we have sought to assign uh, higher allocations to it because we do recognise that there are challenges um, out there in, in Auckland's regional areas. With the, with the road system that it would also be positive to address. Um, so this is reflecting some of the guidance that we've had through the mayoral proposal. I'm worth noting too, if I just add to that, 124 million over 10 years, it's actually not a significant amount of money when you think about $12 million a year type thing as a straight line relative to the amount we're spending on the renewal and maintenance of the rest of the network. Um, so I think it would be fair to say that that part of the program has historically been underfunded ideally from where we'd like to and part of it was to do with the inability to secure some co-funding but yeah it's yeah that's good cool. the, the question and the next question is probably for the mayor um because it's i assume your your words expensive gold-plated cycleways um where are those where have they been done um if you're talking about things like key street that was rebuilding a 75 million dollar um, seawall or Karangahapi Road where I think 80% of the budget was spent on pipes and the road and other things. So I guess what is meant by gold-plated cycleways and we've seen 
almost no cycleways built, and um, there'd definitely been none in the North Shore. There's $400 million worth of cycleways still in there, and all of those ones could have been done cheaper. Um, the, the K Road one um, isn't all about pipes. The costs were way higher than they needed to have been. And we have had, I have an announcement next week, which will, um, I can't quite make yet, which will confirm what my thoughts were. Nevertheless, we're only consulting on, not on the details of how, we, how they do their work and how they choose which road to do. But I do want to point out that the loaded question from Councillor Derby about, sa about saving lives, um, the, the, one of the major killers of lives is the poor state of our roads and we don't do anything about repairing those. And the government, this government, and in fact the last Minister of Transport, who unfortunately wasn't his job very long, also realised that the road surface is a major contribute to safety, and we haven't looked after it. No, so that, um, that, That's fine. I was just understanding how some budgets got reduced quite a lot and some other budgets... Well, it's got got to, everything's got to come somewhere. Right? There's still $480 million for cycleways, so I'm sure we'll get some on the North Shore for you. No, no. Um, I'm not wanting that necessarily talking about local, but I'm just trying to understand where that... You can ride a bike on loose metal, actually. It's not actually um, overruled. In fact, it's a major sport in New Zealand, but I don't want to get into that one either. We're just talking about the big numbers here rather than the details. That's OK. Thank you. And just a very last question for AT, maybe for Stacey. Will, when we make final decisions on this, will we have enough information on, because most of those lower um, patronage buses are feeder services and rural services. Will we have a understanding of how they affect certain populations and how they might affect congestion and the overall um, bus network? Because obviously those feeders really help those services that actually would get really good um, income from. You know, they pay for themselves two or three times because of the feeder services sometimes into them. Yes, Councillor, we absolutely will. We'll do a, a, a full review in terms of that and then provide what the risks are associated with each one in terms of that. So once we've got that figure, then what we will do is look to see how we can do that with the least impact to keeping the integrity of the network as a whole. And, and then we will be able to provide more detailed information about what that means. It may not be for route removals, it might be in terms of a, a reduced timetable, as an example. So it's, it's quite a lengthy exercise, but yes, we'll provide a lot more information. Co the consultation with the public will also provide more information as well. Thank you for that. Councillor Newman, please. Thank you. Um, question to AT relating to... Uh, that was Councillor Newman. I've just caught... Sorry, you've... <laughs> yeah, I've got you on the list there, Councillor Lee, but... Uh, well, I'll go with the order that I've got them up here, which is Councillor Newman first, and then Councillor Bartley, and then and show you well prepared Councillor Lee after Councillor Bartley. Thank you. Sorry, Mike. Um, look, um, just came back to the low fare box um, services, just to confirm the Auckland Transport that those services have been um, consulted through the RPTPs and subsequently agreed with funding for contracts and that they are current? Yes, in terms of uh, what was proposed in the list you have, they are all current services and currently funded, uh, but in terms of meeting their targets, no, not at the moment. Yeah. No, but you will appreciate that most of the services under contract aren't necessarily going to be, they're not going to commercially wipe their face, which is why they're under contract in the RPTP. Um, if they were wiping their face, um, they'd be profit making. But um, can I ask the, the Qatar services, just to clarify, are they also in the RPTP or a different contract process? I think, um, thank you, Councillor. I think you, we're confusing a couple of things here in terms of them. So, in, 
the RPTP obviously sets the direction in terms of that future network and what we aspire to in terms of growth and patronage and routes and services. And so the way current, current contracts um, and bus services are contracted is, is through the public transport operating model in terms of that. And so with that, of course, currently, you know, a third comes from fares. Well, that's what we would like to achieve, a third from fares, and then 51% from Wakakotahi, and then 49% local share. So that's how it's currently done in terms of that. What you have in terms of that list of services is services with a very low fare box ratio. That's why when sort of looking at that network perspective in terms of that, when I'm saying not meeting the targets, I'm meaning not meeting the patronage targets not meeting in terms of what I'll call a financial equation. It's more about are they delivering a point in terms of the patronage for the network? So that's why they are there in terms of it. And and, and with that, obviously, it's a, it's a balance in terms of time, place, marketing to make sure that people actually know the services there. In terms of um, the cattle services, they sit outside of that. And if, and if we, I've just added a little bit specifically on Qatar, so we're close to tendering the Qatar funded services for the North West to make advantage of the new assets that have been built and just gone live. Um, the proposal, and when we talked about some of the numbers in the confidential workshops, the bigger question there, which we still need to work through, is to what extent new services are still rolled out in other jurisdictional geographic parts of the city, um, particularly in the south, and to what extent, you know, these are funded and you know, how we optimise the services within that. As we've talked about in some of those workshops, the, we need to, well, the proposal is to have more flexibility around use of the CATA. Um, but if you kind of look at the proposals that sits now, we're going to be doing some optimisation of existing. Um, we would still like to roll out some services in the South that CATA funded, but we've got to work through and do the maths on how that all fits within this proposal. Yeah, look, I, I'm familiar with, with the PTOM model. And I think that the RPTP is more than, than sort of a guiding document. It's a statutory document. So I just make the point that the low fare box recovery services that have been contracted under PTOM have been through an RPTP proposal, which is important. Can I just come back to um, a couple of other matters? So there are some Auckland Transport Safety initiatives that are, that you have identified for many years, but then shifted them across for proposed funding under the Climate Emergency Response Fund, SURF, which was pitched and promoted as a done deal. I think it's more at risk of being a dud deal now. So if, if, that, if that funding isn't available, um, is Auckland Transport going to be moving um, some of those important safety trans transport safety projects back uh, for delivery um, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the SURF funding might not, well, well, let's say it isn't available, what happens to some of those projects that have been identified as, as pretty essential? Um, going into quite a bit of detail with that, but if I, so the first thing is the SURF money was use it or lose it by 30 June. Um, so we've essentially got just over six months left to, to spend it. Um, there were some cuts in there, particularly around surf funding for things like uh, the K Road works um, around the new station, um, etc. But there, there are some specific safety projects in there, around like a manure over package, etc. Where there is some surf money getting pulled, um, and but there is a few select projects in there we'll look to still finish over the summer holiday, um, where the around schools and things where they're really supported by the um, the community while people while the schools are out. So some, so a small number of them will still continue, um, but yes, there is there are cuts from that so if money being pulled. Yeah, look, cut, cuts from NZTA, isn't it? Not from not from Auckland Transport or the local board. I think that's an important point. Um, just one other thing. Um, yeah, so do you have any data in terms of um, the, the relationship between uh, a lack of um, focus on road maintenance and DSI? A lack of funding for road maintenance and DSI. Well, I don't specifically myself. I can ask the question to like, yeah, we can follow that up. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Bartley, please. 
Thank you. I was going to ask a question about uh, unplanned uh, natural events, but I see there's a line in here for flood response, so I won't go there. I did want to ask what weighting was given to intensification as a consideration in the projects that are being put up to continue being funded? Please. Um, it, it's not a specific uh, lens in terms of general um, uh, intensification. However, we are aware uh, of the Auckland Housing Program is an area of intense growth um, that, uh, that we do want to support with um, sustainable transport options. So uh, we've been looking at uh, Auckland Housing Program as part of the um, program. But of course, areas of intensification uh, where we're expecting high PT growth, you know, they're opportunities. So they're a key factor in a lot of the projects um, that we pull through. Um, and it's uh, therefore it comes through in the prioritisation in terms of expectations about performance of the projects and how well they um, uh, are aligning to the overall growth. So although not direct, it's something we consider indirectly. Okay, thank you. And then also, um, I wanted to ask, uh, I have seen the list of uh, bus routes that are proposed to you know, be, be cut. I wanted to ask, um, is there any thought to how we can speed up behaviour change because I know, like, with the, is it the Northern Busway, people weren't using it initially, and now it's, um, you know, overloaded with passengers. So is there any thinking to do that with, with some of the other projects that are proposed to be cut? Or have we lost hope in the build it and they will come philosophy? Thank you, Councillor. No, absolutely. It's, it's, we're very, very much motivated, obviously, to raised our patronage and that I go back to what we sort of brought to the transport infrastructure committee a couple of months ago that being the growth program so our first objective always is to grow the services in order to be able to make it more sustainable from a cost point and we will continue to do that so those low patronage routes those ones you do have obviously some of them are disproportionate in areas of the network and so from an equity and access perspective, we need to look at that and therefore once we have our target, then make decisions based on that to make sure that we're not isolating parts of the network so they don't have coverage. So that is a real balancing act we'll have to go through uh, in terms of optimising the network. Thank you. And one more. I know the Mayor wants to do things differently um, and I just wanted to ask a basic question. I see some projects in here that are proposed to go forward are uh, going to benefit developers, multi, multi-million dollar developments. Is there any way you have a remit to kind of push back and say to those developers outside of development contributions, hey, um, we can't afford to do the bus infrastructure here. Can you guys um, front up and pay for it instead if you really need it for your shopping centre development? Um. Well, in, in the case of all significant developments, uh, we do uh, seek that developers um, put in place investment uh, that mitigates their sort of immediate effects of their investment. So we're always having those kinds of discussions so that that, that development minimises the impact on, on the transport network. Um, as part of those discussions, we do also explore what opportunities there might be uh, for them to fund other projects, particularly related to their large scale developments. Um, but in terms of things like ongoing operations, that's uh, generally extremely difficult because as you mentioned, development comes to an end and developers don't necessarily want to be um, linked to a, a funding an ongoing service. So um, it's an area where we explore, but unfortunately don't have a great deal of success. Thank you. Good on you. I think the $50 fare limit was aimed at trying to fill up the buses that we've got at the moment. So that's that was a, that was in conjunction with your first part of your question. What can we do to get more people on the bloody things? Michael Lee, please. 
Thank you. Um, to, to, to Auckland Transport, um, I have a couple of questions, and it relates to um, taxes or, or, or uh, levies. Um, and in this particular case, the Ferry Wharf levy. Um, there have been problems and discrepancies, significant discrepancies in collecting this levy in the past. I won't go into that. Probably the report dated 2014 or, or around that time is still highly confidential. But um, in response to complaints um, regarding evident discrepancies between high numbers of passengers, overcrowding indeed, and the, um, the wharf levy, I understand AT has undertaken an investigation and has found discrepancies. Will, will that um, report be made available to the Council, um, given the importance of alternative funding as we go through this process? Uh, I don't think it's appropriate in this forum for us to be talking about that report, being a public forum. Um, happy to discuss that offline. It's, it's, if we're dealing with a budget, we, we need accuracy and transparency over the levies that AT is collecting or, as evident in this case, not collecting. So I won't um, litigate that further. but. I don't believe that's an acceptable approach. It's gone on for too long, and for too long there's been problems because of that lack of transparency. Okay, the second, the second question relates to, again, relates to ferry services, and you'll all realise how problematic they have been over the previous summer. Um, on the Waiheke run, there is a new competitor. Um, it seems to be sorely disadvantaged and one of those disadvantages is, is that AT has not enabled them access um, um, to the hop card, which should be available for all PT services. Will that situation um, be sorted out, please? Thank you, Councillor. That, that's incorrect uh, in terms of the ex access to the system. So initially when ID was setting up, which our team worked very closely with them on to enable that, it was a pre-booked system. Uh, as you're aware, Hop is a, a walk up and tap on service in terms of that. And so therefore that conversation has come later. So we're working with ID in terms of the potential for them to onboard them with Hop and therefore Supergold. Now, given it is a commercially exempt service, we do have to get approval uh, through Waka Kotahi in order to be able to enable that them. I, I'm not, can you just be a little bit clear? Can, are you saying now that that situation has been rectified and that passengers can use a hop card on the Island Direct Ferry Service? Is that correct? No, it's incorrect. So initially, this system, and has been marketed as such, is a pre-booked system. So they have to book online and pay for their fare online. So they are not hop enabled now. And last month, we sat down with them and we decided to explore to be able to use HOP and, su and therefore Supergold services. But there's a process for us to go through to do that because they are a commercially exempt service, particularly when it comes to Supergold, because Supergold, obviously, from the HOP perspective, is publicly funded where these aren't. So we are working with them on that and getting approval with Waka Kotahi to be able to onboard them into that super gold system. So it is a work in progress. We estimate it'll take a couple of months. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll think I'll follow up in writing and, and clarify that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Those are good questions, but we are, I'll remind you we are debating the mayoral proposal for the 10-year budget, and we have a, a meeting tomorrow of the Transport Infrastructure Committee where those sort of squabbles it should be shorted out there. The but wolf, raise a good the wolf point. levy is significant income for the I, council on its budget, Mr. Mayor, with all due respect. No, 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 I accept that, very much so. But uh, the mayoral proposal is not to reduce that income, it's to encourage it. Councillor Fooley, and then we're going to go on to the next bit. Uh, kia ora, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, so, 
on the bus routes, I was surprised to see one of those um, was the airport to Puinui um, as having one of the lowest fare box, um, you know, targets or um, revenue. Can you just confirm whether that, was that just completely based on fare box on the the money received through HOP and otherwise. So, it, did it or did it also count people who don't pay? For example, gold card users, young people, and students. Because, I mean, I'm from that area, and from what I can see, that's a very well used bus route. Thank you, Councillor. It, it is an expensive route due to the frequency. So, in, in terms of that, the cost to deliver it. Uh, outweighs and provides that low, what I'll call fair box recovery. That doesn't mean people aren't using it. Actually, in August 2023, when I was looking at the numbers, 42, over 42,000 people used that service that month. And so it is being used, absolutely. But in terms of it being a high frequency, it's deliberately done that way in order to build patronage to make the airport uh, connectivity to Puanui Station viable for people to use public transport. Uh, it does equate to obviously a lower fair box recovery for that service. That doesn't mean that we don't need it as an essential link, as you rightly point out. Thank you. Yeah, kia ora. Thank you, because it is really, really essential. So I'm just putting that out there, um, especially for an area like mine, which where people don't have lots of transport options. Um, other than that, I just wanted to ask as well about the DSI uh, deaths and serious injury statistics and the effect uh, on um, the projects that you've got running out in the Manukau ward. Um, you know, my ward has some of the highest death and serious injury statistics. And there are some projects that have started and been completed that are only now beginning, we're only now beginning to see the impact. Um, the cut in the budget that's being proposed here, what sort of effect will that have on the projects um, in the Manukau ward and in South Auckland um, more broadly? Kia ora. I'm so familiar with the specifics in your ward, but we can come back to you on that if you'd like. 